Fantastic. So hi, uh, I'm Sam. Um, this is an action photo of me giving a talk about Git. Um, I live in Portland, Oregon, as I think I just mentioned. Uh, some of you may know Portland from the IFC documentary series, Portlandia. Um, it's all true. Uh, <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, almost all of the photos in my slides feature white dudes. Um, this is because being a white dude myself, it's much less awkward for me to make fun of other white dudes than anybody else. Um, but if I use anything in here that is oppressive, please call me on it. Um, I will put my email up on the slides later and you can uh, tell me what I've done wrong. Okay, so I have been turning money into code since 1998 when this beautiful computer came out. I did not get to use one of those. My introduction to programming was uh, through Microsoft Access 97. Uh, I was self-taught and in 2003 I went back to school for a degree in computer science which turned out to be pretty cool. Um, I've been working at Living Social since last April and one of the biggest highlights of working there has been my relatively minor involvement in Hungry Academy. Um, when Jeff emailed the HA list to ask for volunteers, I immediately wrote, wrote back and said, hey, I don't know what you might want me to talk about, but I'll do it. <laughs> um, I'm actually really excited to talk to you today because even though I have no idea who any of you are, I expect every single one of you to be able to kick my ass in a few years. I just want you all to, I just want to let you know that you're all incredibly lucky and I really wish that something like this had been available to me when I was getting started in software. So. Enough about me and you. Today, uh, I'm going to talk about pairing and tooling. Uh, when I asked Jeff what he might want me to talk about, this was what he wrote back. I'd like to loop you in for a talk about pairing and tooling pretty early on, and that's almost all he gave me. So I'm making this up. I hope you like it. Um, I am a big fan of pair programming, and as it happens, I've written some tools to support remote pair programming at Living Social. So my initial notes on this topic were about pairing and tooling. Um, but as I sat down to try to turn them into a cohesive presentation, it turned into uh, much more of a focus on pairing and eventually some tools. Um, this, by the way, is a, uh, I think it was one of the April Fool's uh, jokes. Uh, this one came from Bitbucket, I think, or it's either Bitkeeper or Bitbucket. Uh, I forget which one, but it was all about spooning. <laughs> um, so what I was saying is that there's a f there was, I shifted my focus to talk more about pairing and less about tools. Um, and I, even the tools that I am going to talk about, uh, the most important ones are actually techniques for structuring communication between humans rather than focusing on specific hardware or software. Because one of the biggest realizations of my career so far has been that programming isn't really about telling a computer what to do, it's about telling stories to other people. I'll start with what I really love about pair, pair programming, but just to provide some contracts, uh, context, uh, I want you to know that some of the worst programming experiences of my life have been in bad pairings. I actually once quit a job midway through my fifth week uh, it was partly because I hated the company culture, which was sort of office spacey, but a large part of it was because I'd been assigned to work with someone whose style and personality were such a terrible fit for me that I was crying in the bathroom by the second week. Um, so I'm not like, pair programming, yay! But um, actually, I kind of still am, but it's in spite of that, that uh, experience. Um, on the other hand, <laughs> I actually, I always learn something valuable from everyone that I pair with, even that person. Um, and most of the time pairing works pretty well for me. Uh, there's even one person that I've changed companies to work with twice. Um, and getting to pair with him is really awesome because when we do get the chance to, uh, we're both at a similar level and we've worked together long enough that we can go really, really, really fast. And that's incredibly liberating. Um, one of the reasons that I like pair programming is that in general, um, despite so what a lot of people initially think, it is faster in some ways. It lets you detect uh, typos, gold plating, 
Uh, Yagni, by the way, uh, stands for you ain't gonna need it. Um, it lets you detect when you have, or it gives you more chances, I guess, to detect when you're like going down a rat hole and there's um, very little uh, return on what you're doing. Uh, lets you find uh, catch yak shaving maybe a little bit faster because there's always somebody else to um, you know to basically call you on it uh, to say hey what what's the original problem we're solving here and the thing that I personally like the uh, the most about um, this category of of benefits of pair programming is uh, that it it helps me stay on task. Um, being immediately accountable to another human being helps keep me focused on the work, um, even when running the tests uh, exceeds my Twitter threshold, which is about 10 seconds, by the way. <laughs> um, if I'm sitting there for 15 seconds while the tests go, I have left the building. Um, another thing that I like about pair programming is that it, it helps you learn better and faster. Um, the phrase that I absolutely love to hear when pair programming is, wait, what did you just do? Um, <laughs> because it means that you're about to learn some random, oh, sorry. It means that you're about to learn some random editor trick or some little command line program that's going to save you cumulatively a couple of weeks over your career. Um, and I almost never have a pair programming session that doesn't involve one of those, which is just fantastic. It's a, it's a great way to transmit that sort of implicit knowledge. Um, I also like pair programming because it lets me work with lots of smart people and see how they solve problems, which gives me more tools that I can use later. Um, once in a while, I even get to work with smart people and show them something new, which is always fun. And Last, I think what's most important about pair programming is that it leads to better code. Um, there's this thing called teddy bear programming. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, basically, you keep a teddy bear on your desk, and when you get stuck on a problem, you put the keyboard down and you turn to the bear, and you explain to the bear out loud what your problem is. And the reason you do this is that the, in the act of explaining in words to somebody else, it doesn't even have to be a person, this is why we use teddy bear, you almost always figure out what the problem is as you're, as you're trying to explain it. Um, so, let's see, where was I? Better code. Um, having different perspectives gives you more different ways of approaching a problem. This is kind of a rehash of what I said on the last slide. Um, if you rotate your pairs, so if you don't always pair with the same person all the time, um, that's a really fantastic way of distributing knowledge about your system throughout the team very quickly. Um, there is one guy who used to live in Portland and now is in Seattle who advocated uh, what he called promiscuous pairing. And at his team, they were actually switching pairs every 90 minutes throughout the day, which um, I've tried that. I have actually tried that for a couple of months on, on one of the teams I was on, and it was pretty cool. Um, it, it really does um, get everybody touching all of the code really fast, which is a nice way of uh, improving your truck factor. Um, so I'm guessing, oh, this also is from the spooning series. <laughs> um, I'm guessing that you've probably had at least one pair programming exercise already, is that? Yeah. 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 Okay, cool. Um, so you're familiar with the basic, basic logistical issues. Um, some of you may have also had the experience of the keyboard collision where both people start typing and you have this text train wreck. Um, you will appreciate this next bit. Um, this is the Mind Yours protocol. I ran across this a few months ago, and it is surprisingly powerful considering that this literally consists of two words and two inflections. Um, I'll start with the statement forms. You can say yours or mine. The, you say yours when you want to pass control to your partner. and you, The mine part is optional, um, but if you're in a very noisy environment, it can be useful to say, yes, I heard you, and I'm, I'm going to type now. Um, it also kind of makes me feel like commander data on the enterprise saying, I have the con, which is always fun. 
Um, so moving on to the question forms, uh, if you are stuck or if you sense that your partner is stuck, you can say mine to indicate that maybe you'd like to take a turn or you can say yours uh, if you're kind of clueless about what, where to go next. Um, the thing I like about this mine yours thing is that if you can agree to do this with your partner, it gives you a very terse, uh, focused, lightweight way of signaling these transitions. Um, it's really just about one thing. It's about quickly negotiating who's got the keyboard. And that means that this can be used in just about any pairing workflow. Um, speaking of pairing workflows, uh, a lot of the descriptions that I've seen of pair programming, they focus on having two dedicated roles. The driver is the one with their hands on the keyboard. And they're focused on the in-the-moment implementation of the current thing that they're doing. Next to them, the navigator is responsible for looking a little bit further down the road. They're anticipating the next feature. They may have a notepad or an index card or maybe their own text editor window that they're using to keep track of to-do items. Uh, sometimes I have problems with this. Uh, it, that pattern obviously works for somebody, but um, I have ADD. And when I'm sitting there for a long time in one role, it can be a recipe for daydreaming or frustration. Um, when I'm driving, I find it hard to avoid thinking ahead, which means my pair partner has to constantly say, hey, you ain't gonna need it, or you don't need that yet. Uh, when I'm the navigator, um, I tend to sort of wander off as my partner is typing something, or I can be very micromanaging, which is like, oh, hey, there's a typo there, or oh, hey, here's this cool little editor trick, and I have to constantly fight my tendency to grab the keyboard and never give it back, um, which I have to, yeah, I've had that done to me and it was not fun and so I have to constantly pay attention to that. Um, ultimately what I really want from pair programming is faster feedback. <laughs> Good, somebody's still awake. Um, what I find is that working in those really small back and forth feedback loops helps keep me more engaged. Um, this is one of the things that I really latched onto when I first discovered test driven development. And uh, in fact, my, the pair programming workflow that I prefer the most uh, leverages that red green refactor heartbeat that you get uh, when you apply test driven development. It is called ping pong pairing. Um, this is from a movie about ping pong that I never saw, but it had some really funny ads. Um, and uh, like the sport that it's named after, the control goes back and forth fairly fast. This is the version that I first learned. Person A writes a test, watches it fail, and says, yours. Person B makes that test pass, that's the green. They refactor as necessary, that's to make it right. And then they write another test, watch it fail, and they say, yours and person A makes that test pass and so on. And so in this pattern, if you're doing test-driven development uh, and you're writing fairly small unit tests, uh, this goes back and forth pretty fast. Um, there are a couple things I like about this. Uh, it helps me pay attention because I know that the keyboard is coming back to me possibly within the next few seconds and I'm gonna slow things down if I have to like look at the, at the code and figure out what it is that I'm supposed to be doing next. The other thing that I really like about this is it helps me encur it helps encourage me to do the simplest thing that could possibly work. Um, this is a catchphrase in the uh, extreme programming extreme programming in agile communities. Um, and when I'm working in red <laughs> in pair pr in a ping pong pairing way, I actually often find myself deliberately doing the stupidest, dumbest thing I could possibly do just to make the test pass. So if my pair partner asserts that add 41 and one should return 42, and that's the only test for that method, I will define that method, hard code 42, watch it pass. I'll add another, <laughs> can't believe it, um, I'll add another test or another assertion saying that add 41 and two returns 43. I'll watch that fail and slide the keyboard, keyboard back. Um, I call this one undersmanship. Um, and it's like, it's stupid, it's petty, and I find it addictively entertaining. And the really funny thing about it is that it actually does 
in a lot of cases lead to better, simpler code than I would have written by myself. Um, so this may not work for everybody, but I enjoy it and I thought I would share it. Um, so ping ponging lets you scale down to fairly small steps. Um, it's, not a, it's not out of the question for a control to pass back and forth a few times a minute when you're writing unit tests around some small function, but there are times when your tests get bigger or you can't avoid you know, writing the test for that next big method that you're not quite sure what it does. And so when it bogs down, um, a friend of mine likes to use this slight variation on ping pong pairing, which is that instead of making the test pass, you're allowed to switch once you have changed the message. Just a second. So if your pair partner writes a test for a new method foo, and the test fails because foo is not defined, you can define it, uh, give it a null or a hard-coded return value, and as soon as you've changed the message from that method is not defined to I expected 42 and I got my hovercraft is full of eels, that's a change of the message, and you can exercise the option to say yours and pass control back. And then your pair partner can do the next thing, and if they can either make the test pass or change it again and pass control back to you. Um, one thing that I didn't put in my notes or in these slides, but that, that comes up here, is um, this process in test-driven development of writing a test and watching it fail is really important um, for changing the message. Uh, I actually, just yesterday afternoon, I was pairing with somebody, and we spent oh, probably an hour being very, very confused because no matter what we did, we were still getting the same stupid error message. And as it happens, I finally like noticed what I'd done and smacked myself over the head. Um, in my editor, I had we had changed the name of a file because there had been a typo in the original version. So in my editor, I said, okay, save this to that new file. And unfortunately, I didn't use the command that tells the editor to write further changes to that new file. So I saved a copy to the new file, and then I kept saving the old one. <laughs> and uh, the code that I was editing was not the code that was actually being exercised by the test. So that first part of watching it fail is really critical, and uh, observing that has actually saved me a fair bit of time over the years. Um, this is a good stopping point. I'm about halfway through my slides. Um, has anybody got a question so far? Do you hear me, sir? Um, pretty well. Okay. Um, who dictates the process for... Uh, who dictates the process for, for the pair programming, or is it something that is given to you? Um, all of these are sort of emergent patterns. Um, it kind of depends on your team. Some of you may wind up on teams where they already have a rigid established workflow. And some of you uh, will have to negotiate this on a pair by pair or even a pairing session by pairing session basis. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do this. <clears throat> I, in my pairing, I just tend to do whatever feels like the right thing, but I know that when I get stuck or bogged down, I can revert to one of these established patterns and use it to take small steps to get myself out of a mess. Um, does that help answer your question? All right, I think that's good. Okay. Um, so when you're doing pair programming in person, it's pretty easy. You shove the keyboard and maybe the mouse, if you're into that, uh, back and forth across the desk. or <laughs> I just heard your daughter, Jeff. That's awesome. Um, or you can plug in a second keyboard and mouse. Um, but when you can't be in the same place, you have to get a little bit more creative. Hold on a sec, Sam. Sure. Give it a shot, Sam. Okay, how's that? Check one, check two, etc. Go so, for it. All right. You got it. Excellent. Um... So when you're doing remote pair programming, there are uh, basically three uh, kinds of problems that you have to solve. You have to have some kind of network connection, duh. Um, you have to figure out how to share your coding environment. And most importantly, you have to figure out the way that you're going to communicate with your pair partner. 
Um, which specific tools uh, you choose is basically a question of trade-offs and constraints. Some tools are better suited to different environments. Um, but you, they do affect, your choices in one area may affect your choices in other areas. So you may be really good at Sublime Text or, you know, I spent six years doing TextMate and my fingers are wired for TextMate. I can do stuff that is um, very, very cool. Um, but if you're working from a rest area in the Texas Panhandle, where you can only get an edge connection tethered through your phone, which you've tied to a kite for the reception, um, <laughs> that's not going to work so well. Um, or even worse, you could be in a hotel and trying to use their Wi-Fi. Uh, that really sucks. Um, there are a few basic uh, kinds of approaches to solving uh, these, these different problems. Uh, there are multi-user editors, like there's the Cloud9 IDE, there's a text editor for Mac called Subitha Edit, there's a few others. Um, you can share somebody's screen using Skype or VNC or JoinMe or iChat or lots and lots of other things. Um, you can use the terminal uh, and use SSH and either Tmux or Screen and uh, use those to share your, your coding environment. Um, the terminal one, you can either have one person host, and that's basically kind of the equivalent of screen sharing, or everybody can connect to a shared server, which is a bit more like the multi-user editors, only it's sort of built into Unix for free. Um, here are some of the pros and cons of each of those. Um, I didn't quite have enough room. Oh yeah, I did actually. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but I will point out that one of the things that bugs me more than anything else is when I am on the remote end of a screen sharing session and I'm trying to type into an editor, and I type pretty fast, and if there's any perceptible lag at all um, between the, when I press a character and when it shows up on screen, I'm just completely useless. So I tend to favor, to favor the terminal approach versus screen sharing because Screen sharing pushes a lot of pixels across the, the network. Um, and uh, even if you're doing a really huge terminal session, um, characters and even you know color control codes uh, still take up a lot less space. And you don't have to push the entire screen all, all the time. You can just push, you know, move the cursor here, print these five characters, and you'll be done. Uh, works pretty well. Sam, I was just thinking <coughs> yeah. with uh, those kind of you know, screen sharing approaches. Do you ever see people uh, drop their machine resolution to like 1024, 768? So um, that's, that's a great point. Um, I have been known to deliberately share the smallest screen on my system, and I, I do use multiple, as many as I can get. Um, partly because of that issue of you're just not pushing as many pixels, and partly because uh, when you're sharing one screen to another screen and still trying to use the other computer for anything else, um, it's nice to not have to scale all the graphical elements down. Um, so I will often share like my laptop screen so that somebody else can bring it up on their external display and slide it around and see the whole thing at, at native resolution. Um, but yeah, uh, I've done that. Um, I definitely uh, have seen other people do that as well. Um, for both of those reasons. And for me, like, when I'm programming, I want as many characters on the screen as possible so that I don't have to hold as much stuff in my head. And making the screen smaller uh, kind of contradicts that. But, yeah, that is one totally valid approach. Um, anything else? No. Okay. So, um, how many of you are still paying attention? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> um, I put that in because, uh, you know, I realized that I'd gone three, three slides in and violated like half of the rules of presentations and just in, just in writing those slides my attention wandered. Um, and I chose to turn that into a way of transitioning to my next point, which is that um, we are weak. <laughs> <laughs> I, I grew up, <laughs> this is a screenshot from the movie Johnny Mnemonic, 
which is absolutely terrible, and you should watch it because it's awesome. Um, I really like movies that are so bad they're funny. This is definitely one of those. Um, but I chose this also because I I grew up when cyberpunk was like still a thing you could say without people sort of snickering a bit. And for a long time, I internalized this idea that, that comes up again and again in cyberpunk novels that bodies are just the meat. Uh, you know, it's an imperfect substrate for this sort of pure computation of the mind. Um, where was I? Uh, meat. Um, just that we ignore, <laughs> um, uh, we ignore our bodies at our own peril. Uh, I think that's enough of that. We can only look at Keanu for so long without whoa. <laughs> um, so again, I, and this is a reuse of a slide earlier, where programming is about telling stories. Um, and I, I say that because we are social animals. Um, our brains devote an astonishing amount of computing power to things like face recognition, voice recognition, grooming order, tone, body language, and so on. Uh, the expression, a picture is worth a thousand words, is basically, you know, the way I interpret that is, is saying that you know, human consciousness is highly parallelized and there's lots of different ways that you can get information from person to person. Um, and I'm throwing up these slides to, to make you laugh, but they also make a point. Um, which is, you know, about this thing that I've started in my head calling primate bandwidth. Um, getting back to remote pair programming, um, technically an experienced pair can do everything they need to do with just a shared coding environment and maybe an instant message window. But one of the best things about pair programming is that when you get stuck, you can step away from the computer and have a longer conversation and discuss options with your pair partner. Um, I have spent over 90% of my time at Living Social working and mostly pairing remotely. Um, I can tell you that while the tools have finally made something like that possible um, and actually pretty tolerable, um, they're still not as good as working face-to-face, -face, or as we used to call it, working in meat space. So, for working remotely, at a, ver at, a minim da -da -da -da. Excuse me. at a bare minimum, you need a decent voice connection. Um, speaking of which, is mine any better? Okay. Okay. Good. Um, so... I generally prefer uh, voice over IP to uh, my cell phone, um, partly because I don't like my phone, and um, at least as a phone, it's a great it's a great little pocket computer, um, but it sounds like the grown-ups in a Charlie Brown holiday special. Um, it's probably also worth investing at least mm, twenty bucks in a headset. Um, I think you guys all got. Um, Apple laptops is part of the program, is that right? Awesome. Um, those things have a really impressive little camera and microphone in the lid, um, and it works pretty well in a quiet room, um, but is your room ever quiet? Mine almost never is. Um, one other thing about using a headset is that um, it puts your, I mean, the reason I suggest you use a headset is that it puts the microphone closer to your mouth. Um, but one of the drawbacks of that can be that if you don't position the mic properly, then you get this effect, which is terribly distracting. Um, so it's worth spending a little bit of time monitoring your own audio just to figure out where to put the, the microphone. Um, if you have the hardware and the bandwidth to support it, um, adding video chat can be really nice. Uh, at Living Social, we had, uh, actually, apparently we had piles of iPad 2s just sitting around uh, from, I think a lot of them were from upgrades where we, you know, the new one came out and we upgraded sales reps and then, hey, we've got these little iPads laying, uh, you know, sitting on a desk somewhere. Uh, somebody had the bright idea to see if they would be useful for pair programming. Um, I volunteered as soon as I heard about it because, hey, free iPad. Um, but I was actually really surprised at what a difference it made in my day-to-day -day programming experience. So here is a picture I took oh, an hour ago of my desk 
which yes, is in my basement, um, and very messy, and there's wires hanging all around. But um, the, the point here is that I have my iPad 2 set up with the camera at about eye level, and it's off to one side of my primary display where I have the code. Um, having it, the camera be at eye level isn't strictly necessary, but for one, it's a more flattering angle. And also, because it's off to the side, my pair partner has some more clues about where my focus is. Um, I've been working a lot with uh, another developer uh, at Living Social, whose name is uh, Matt Swayze, and I had him grab a few screenshots uh, just to illustrate this. Uh, this is me in my lovely basement looking at my screen. This is the, the big uh, Thunderbolt display that was right in the middle there. Um, as I look at this, I realize I probably need better lighting because you, know, you can't see anything for the lower half. Um, but again, this is me, me with my focus on the code. This is me with my hands still on the keyboard, but looking over, glancing over to check in as I talk, um, just to say, hey, you know, you're still paying attention, or what was that noise I heard in the background? Um, this is me, you know, having taken my hands off the keyboard and turned my chair a bit to face the camera directly and indicate that, hey, I'm ready for a longer conversation. Um, the quality of this screen grab, you know, it's definitely nowhere near as good as sitting face to face, but it is it is a pretty nice uh, addition. And like I say, I was I was not expecting to get a lot out of it, but I would be very uh, reluctant to give the iPad back at this point. Um, so as for the the tools that I use, um, I'm always tweaking my setup, but this is what I'm using right now. Um, just for using, for just for getting from one computer to another over the network, I use uh, LogMe and Hamachi, and I use that to uh, get an SSH connection. Um, I use Wemux and Vim, and we use uh, this thing that I have up here in an URL is the uh, Living Social Pairing Toolset that I wrote, um, or at least wrote a lot of, and that's up there on GitHub. You can use it. Um, it's got a bunch of advice and uh, some scripts that. I would be hesitant to point anybody out if they weren't on an Apple, but you guys are all fine. So, um, for pairing, as I mentioned, I use the use the iPad, and the the iPad is really great for one-to-one -one communication. But we also have a lot of remote meetings, and for those, or for those few times when I'm doing pair programming with more than a pair, uh, I'll switch to Google Hangout. Um, doesn't work so well on the iPad, you have to plug in a headset, so I actually just switch over to my Mac. Um, I also put up here this thing called Shush, which if you're going to be doing any kind of group video chat is absolutely indispensable. It gives you basically the ability to push a modifier key on your keyboard, and when you push that, your mic either uh, mutes or unmutes. You can choose which one it is. Again, it's really nice for uh, those conversations where the focus keeps shifting because somebody's breathing into their, their headset. Um, so as I mentioned, I put, the, I put together that LS Pair Toolkit um, specifically because I wanted to be able to do remote pairing with uh, one of my coworkers. Uh, what I did not expect was that the LS Pair Toolkit would turn out to be really useful for local pairing as well. Um, basically, I don't, I don't have to think about the, the video chat issues, but everything else I pretty much use the same setup. And I've actually found myself using, working in Tmux and Vim, even when I'm working by myself. And the reason that I do that is because it makes it much, much easier to, if I get stuck or if I want somebody to come look at something, just say, hey, SSH into my machine and type Wemux pair and have a look at this. And I don't have to uh, transfer all of my working state from one editor to another. I can just have them come in, have a look, and it makes it, it, makes it much more um, instantly accessible and casual. And makes it much more like you're working in the same office and you just have somebody come look at your screen for a couple minutes. Um, another thing that I found, though, is that when I've done a lot of, well, I've done a lot of traditional pair programming uh, with two people sitting at one desk looking at the same screen, and I'm pretty used to that. Uh, but it does take a lot of infrastructure. You need a big desk, um, or you need to hack the desk that you have, 
and you need another keyboard and mouse probably uh, you need some elbow room um, I found myself uh, stocking up on gum and so I could have a pack of gum on my desk and I, if somebody had bad breath I could just casually say hey I'm having some gum you want some too um, so you don't have to come right out and say hey your breath stinks um, I didn't quite work up to uh, keeping deodorant on my desk as well and I hope that you never have to consider that um, but using remote pairing tools opens up a lot of new possibilities for the ways that you can work with each other. Uh, removing the constraint that you have to share the same physical device and just position yourself to look at the same screen means that you can pair standing up at one of these little small drink tables at a conference. Uh, you can pair at a coffee shop. Um, I call this the you sync my battleship configuration. <laughs> the, thing that I, the thing I really like about this one, um, I actually uh, hung out with somebody in the evenings a month or two ago and was doing some pair programming and the thing I really liked about this was I'd be looking down at my screen I could just lift my eyes up and check in with him for instant eye contact and then look back down at the screen again and if there's a more involved conversation you can just close the lid on your laptop you know pull out the index cards or whatever and then when you're done you just pop the laptop back open. It's pretty cool. Um, Using the remote pairing, you know, any of these remote pairing tools, you can pair on an airplane. Um, you need to remember to pack an Ethernet cable if you're going to try this, but it's pretty cool. Um, and you can pair with anybody. Um, if you guys don't know who James Edward Gray is, that's the guy on the left, um, you need to go and subscribe to the Ruby Rogues podcast right now. He's one of the regular uh, hosts of the show and uh, ridiculously smart. I mean, they're all ridiculously smart, but James is often very funny and has uh, interesting things to say, and he knows uh, way too much about Ruby. Um, I actually got to pair with James about six months ago at Aloha RubyConf, uh, which was made much easier by the fact that I'd already been using SSH and Tmux, and it was just, hey, let's just sit around the same table so that we can hear each other. Um, I'll have you SSH to my machine, and it worked great. That is the end of my prepared remarks, as they say. Um, any more questions? Well, first, to say thank you, sir. Uh, questions? Or let me put it another way. I will not shut up until three of you have asked questions. Any uh, exercises or drills you recommend to kind of get in sync or like get going when you first start with your pairing partner? Hmm. Um, yeah, I would say ping pong pairing. Um, if you really want to um, start on something that is like kind of a throwaway, like just as kind of a warm up exercise, um, you can pick like a code kata. Um, is this something, Jeff, that you've talked about? Uh, yeah, a little bit. And we're okay. actually going to, Katrina's been working on a collection of uh, specific warm-up exercises for us, little half-hour exercises. Oh, awesome. Okay, cool. Same ideas. And you're going to publish that so I can see it, right? Yeah, definitely. They're actually up already. We just uh, haven't really pointed out the link. Oh, very cool. Um, so, yeah, I, I might start with, like, the, you know, keep the Ruby koans around, or if you're beyond those already, you could do... There are a couple of exercises that I've done. There's uh, Dark Chess is one you can search for. Um, there's the famous XP Bowling Calculator. Um, you just pick some small problem and uh, actually um, you could probably look at the... Um, what's the thing that Corey Haynes is doing? Uh, code Retreat. You could probably use uh, any of the Code Retreat exercises as warm-ups as well. Um, but for specifically warming up to pairing, I, I strongly recommend the ping pong pairing so that you, you get that experience of transferring back and forth. Um, that's one of the things that a lot of people have trouble with. And um, if you're having trouble doing something, you should do it more. Cool. Uh, next question. I'll repeat it to you in a second, Sam. Okay. Sure, sure. So, Sam, we've been using uh, Pomodoro technique hmm. quite a bit in class. Yeah. Uh, do you use it with pairing and do you find that it's helpful or does it kind of like interrupt things when you're in the flow? 
Um, it depends. Um, I have worked with one or two people who really liked Pomodoro, um, and when they are able to maintain focus and deliberately shut down distractions um, for that 25 minutes that you're that you're going and paying attention, um, that can work really well. Um, personally, I have found that it it interrupts me. Um, Although sometimes that's a good thing. Uh, one of the things about time boxing is that even if you and your pair partner both don't recognize that you're starting to shave a yak, um, having that timer go off and you look up and you go, wait, what time is it already? Um, that gives you a, a nice little heartbeat to decide whether you want to continue doing what you were doing. Um, uh, can you define for us uh, shave a yak and throw in bike shedding while you're at it? <laughs> All right. I actually do have... Uh, I had a link prepared, but it's easier just to... All right. So this is... Yak shaving is, you know, I want to wax the car. Oop. The hose is still broken from the winter. I need to go to Home Depot. But Home Depot, I need to borrow the easy. I need an easy pass to get there. I could borrow one from a neighbor. Oh, but I have to return the pillow. And the pillow, I can't. You know, I, I can't return the pillow yet because the stuffing fell out, and we need to get some yak hair to restuff it. And this is the bit that I love. It's like the next thing you know, you're at the zoo, the zoo, shaving a yak. Also, you can wax your car. Um, this yak shaving is basically finding yourself at the wrong end of a very long dependency chain. Um, did I lose anybody on that one? That's good. Okay. Um, and, uh, oh, you mentioned bike shedding was the other one. Um, bike shedding is this idea that if you propose, uh, to put a nuclear reactor in, um, uh, somewhere, uh, most people will look at that and go, huh. Um, so if you, if you, you know, propose this thing and then you have a request for comments period, um, you're probably not going to get a lot of responses because most people, um, a nuclear reactor is such a big and complicated thing that they can't hold it in their heads and they're going to be more likely to assume that people know what they're doing and that engineers are looking at it and yeah, go ahead. That's, you know, you know, regardless of your feelings of nuclear, about nuclear reactors, um, your comments on the construction or design are probably not going to be, um, you're probably not going to want to make them. Uh, however, everybody knows how to build a bike shed. And so when you propose something small, um, there's this tendency among geeks of a, of a certain mindset, which is to say programmers, uh, to uh, say, hey, I know how to build a bike shed. You should paint it blue. <laughs> or you should use this kind of wood. And so you get lots of endless discussions about the small details and not enough attention paid to larger arch architectural issues. Um, Jeff, did I miss anything there? Yeah, no, I think that's good. Okay. Steve was just uh, expounding on bike shooting. Yeah, I almost heard it in the background and it sounded a little more concise than I managed to be, so thank you. Uh, should we do one more question? You can do as many as you want, I'm here all day. because of pairing, um, what's like a way that if you've been in a really bad pair, like how have you coped with it? To go pair counseling? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think I heard most of that. So was, was the question about um, when I was in that horrible pairing experience, like how, how can you make that better? Yeah, how do you, how do you kind of get a bad pairing situation on track? Well, obviously my solution is to quit. Um, <laughs> I don't know. This is, I mean, there's chemistry involved in pair programming. Um, there's chemistry involved in all kinds of work and sometimes it works better than others. Um, that's a, a much bigger question than I can probably fit into a reasonable answer. Um, but one thing that I find is an incredibly valuable skill in in any kind of conversation about programming is being able to take your ego out of it. Um, to be able to, you know, focus on here's what's working, here's what's not working. 
and are there ways that we can change what we're doing to achieve the effects that we want? Um, was that sort of vague and <laughs> unhelpful enough for you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anything else? I think they're ready for lunch, sir. So All right. thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Let me slap around right up here. And uh, they have your info I put on our outline and stuff for today. So, awesome. uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time, and uh, talk to you again soon. All right, thanks.